Welcome to Early Man, to Neolithic Communities, 7 million to 2500 BC. This is Melinda Cole Klein. Some historians tackle big questions like, what does it mean to be human? And this is a profound question. It asks scientists and historians to study human creativity. Humans are what humans do. We travel and migrate, often out of sheer curiosity, as well as to find food and shelter. By 15,000 BC, humans had traveled mostly overland and settled on all the continents except Antarctica. They built shelters and lived in caves, created tools and left artifacts. Prior to the 19th century myth, legend, and religious doctrines that offered answers about human origins and the meaning of human existence, scientists started to answer these questions. As professional history developed, scholars considered that biblical stories were of limited value in the study of history and dismissed them as myth lacking evidence and solid theories. Scientists began to argue that because of similarity between different species, this evidence commonly observed did not support the biblical theory of individual creation. Challenging the authority of the biblical account required new method of inquiry, a system for organized knowledge. By the mid-1800s, a new intellectual environment had begun to become more accepted as it grew out of scientific theories of earlier philosophical teachings. And this would include Galileo, John Locke, and Sir Isaac Newton. From the 1690s, the scientific method called for the direct observation of nature the recording and analysis of observation, and the discussion and debate of findings throughout an international community of scholars. This scientific approach became more acceptable in American and Western Europe by the 1750s. This approach rejected the authority of religious texts that asserted historical truths without presenting substantiating evidence, such as the Earth being the center of the universe, denounced by Galileo, standing contrary to biblical teachings. Separately, Charles Darwin and Alfred Wallace arrived at the same theory, creating a large controversy. This theory of biological evolution was made possible by scientific observation carefully collected and measured. For Darwin, he had based his research on the study of bird species over a careful study of generations. This would be the finches in 1830s from the Galapagos Islands. By 1859, Darwin was ready to publish his findings and present his theories. This work is remembered to history as On the Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection. Taking this to include man in this evolutionary theory became known with the 1871 publication The Descent of Man. In time, evidence of early man was found in China, Africa, and islands situated in the Indian Ocean, such as Java and in North America, skeletons of extinct dinosaurs would be found. The evidence that humans developed over millions of years caused much debate. A scientific classification developed to name and record natural history findings. Humans and Australopithecines are duly known as members of a primate line of hominids, they were warm-blooded, four-limbed social animals and were a part of the mammal family, 
appearing 65 million years ago. The first hominids appeared 7 million years ago. Modern DNA testing has proved that modern humans and great apes have a shared 98% of the same genes. Human evolution includes Homo habilis, Homo erectus, Homo sapiens, and Homo sapiens sapiens. The Earth's climate and environment challenge species to survive. In the process, they adapted to their environment 10 million years ago when temperatures fell during the Ice Age or the Pliocene epoch. This lasted from 2 million years ago until about 9000 BC. Climatologists, geologists, and anthropologists have agreed that at times the planet has been covered in ice. Few regions such as land at the equator remained warmer. Thus, at these locations, mammals evolved and survived to make it to the next generation, evolving over long periods of time as they adapted to their environment. In 1974, in northern Ethiopia, Donald Johansson unearthed a well-preserved skeleton of a 25-year-old female he called Lucy. Mary Leakey's 1977 discovery of fossilized footprints in Tanzania supported visual evidence that Australopithecines walked on two legs. Why would this be an advantage? It was an advantage because some studies suggest that walking and running upright was energy efficient, leaving arms free to carry children or food. The next evolutionary step was to Homo habilis. The greatest feature difference was a 50% increase in brain size. Why did their brains grow? Scientists speculated that it had to do with the variety of food available during the year. Evidence from the 1950s began to discover bone tools among the hominid fossils, as well as evidence of the first controlled use of fire about one million years ago. With continued research by Mary Leakey and her husband Luis in East Africa, these researchers were able to identify a new type of hominid, Homo habilis also known as handyman. This early man used stone tools. These hominids spent their days providing food for their groups as scavengers, but also hunted and carved up their own food. And they also used pelts. This early man stood upright. In time, this hominid and the Australopithecines, who had lived side by side, became extinct. The new species to survive to reproduce was Homo erectus, appearing in Africa and spread from there to Asia from about one million years ago. These hominids had brains another one-third larger than Homo habilis. Between 400,000 and 130,000 BC, the evolutionary process transformed hominids into Homo sapiens. The Latin description for this uh, translates loosely into wise humans. Again, their brains were a third larger than Homo erectus and two-thirds larger than Homo habilis. This new brain size of Homo sapiens gave them the capacity for speech. The physical evolution was remarkable. As the scientific theory of evolution suggests, Homo sapiens began to migrate out of East Africa to all of Africa and then to other lands. Homo sapiens evolved differently in their new environments as suggested by DNA and fossil evidence. Homo erectus moved from Africa to Indonesia, known as Java man. 
In addition, Peking Man has been found in China. Bridges of ice enabled the migration of Homo erectus. Because Europe and Asia were so cold, this early man continued to move. During a German archaeological dig in 1856, archaeologists excavated a thick skull cap in the Neander Valley near Dusseldorf. Some speculated that it was a deformed human. As the story goes, seven years later, Thomas Henry Huxley, leading advocate of Darwin's theory of evolution, argued that the skull found was evidence of a new type of human, previously unidentified. Huxley was correct. However, his further claims proved not to be. Critics suggested the skeleton found was a soldier lost in a previous war. All the while, the misshapen skull could not be explained. This opened the door for claims by Huxley that the Neander Valley skull was evidence of a missing link between pre-humans and modern man. A year after Henry Huxley's claims, scholars gave the skeletal evidence a name, Homo neanderthalensis. When more bones were found, anthropologists reconstructed the appearance of Neanderthals. However, like other skeletal evidence, from dinosaurs to man, this remains difficult because soft tissue, hair, flesh, and also cartilage does not survive as a part of their fossilized remains. Recent imagery pictures Neanderthal man as humpbacked because their spine lacked curves. This structure pushed their heads a bit forward in effort to balance their upright position. Neanderthal man was muscular, but a bit clumsy looking, with heavy jaws and low sloping foreheads, perhaps brutish and lacked intelligence. Neanderthal man has been found from Spain, across Africa and the Middle East, as to as far south as the parts of Africa, from Gibraltar to Iran, and from Northern Europe to Northern Africa. About 40,000 years ago, evolving separately on different continents was the new human Homo sapiens sapiens. This species replaced Neanderthal man and traveled across the Bering Strait into the Americas, walked from Asia to Australia, and north to Arctic regions. One adaptation that helped them to conform and survive in their new environment was the change in skin color. Dark skin tones of today's tropical populations have a feature built in that reduced the harmful effects of the sun. In places of little sunshine about 5,000 years ago, pale skin of Europeans developed a loss of pigment, enabling them to produce vitamin D from sunshine received, though they were susceptible to skin cancer and sunburn. This was especially true of Arctic Eskimos from Asia, in which their skin lightened in comparison with their Asian ancestors. At the same time, Homo sapiens sapiens developed diverse ways of eating, the shelters in which they lived, and how they lived to reproduce and survive. Social activities and differences between groups of humans were expressed in how they lived along with their activities. These would include aspects of the new types of shelters they inhabited, the tools they used, the art they produced, and the cooking and storage vessels they created. Other characteristics, if they could be known, would be their behaviors, language, and the structure of their beliefs. Early man used stone tools. By 35,000 BC, the construction of these tools became highly technical in nature. 
In addition, preference for stone types such as obsidian became more extensive. This is common. Such tools were effective in killing large, slow-moving animals. Homo sapiens were more skilled in hunting large animals such as mastodons and bison. They made spears, axes, and saws. So skillful in hunting, naturalists argue that they helped to drive large animals into extinction. However, recent evidence has shown this is not true. Homo sapiens took homemaking seriously. They utilized every part of the animal killed, such as using pelts for skins. From the environment, they learned how to weave natural fibers, such as large leaves, into mats, which could have been used as enclosures or to sleep on. Additionally, natural materials were woven into storage bins and baskets to carry perhaps food or other items collected. The first cooked foods were probably done by accident. As mentioned, early humans set fires on purpose. Likely, post-fire scavenging led to a preference for cooked meat. Through the like and dislike of consuming cooked meats, early humans from 1 million BC would have come to the conclusion that meat eaten cooked digested better. This lacked the cramping in the gut as the body worked very hard to digest raw meat. Another piece of evidence has to do with the materials produced by early humans, and this was the appearance of clay cooking pots that date back to 12,500 BC. In the study of primates, research suggests that apes and other primates do not engage in long-term relationships developed from sexual unions. The relationship between mother and offspring was the strongest tie. The relationship between siblings was also a strong and long-lasting one. This research among primates supports the theory that the center of early human family was the mother key to understanding the development of committed emotional ties between male and female humans, scientists argue the answer lies in the transformation of the reproductive cycle among human females. While this is not true of other mammals, early hominids over a long time evolved to be able to produce children year round. It is suggested that humans, because they could mate at any time for the reason of producing children that would offer continuation of the tribal band, human men and women became choosy about their partners. This resulted, among women, the innate and natural tendency to gravitate towards the strong male with broad shoulders who had proven himself in the tribe as a warrior. For women, it was the strong male that offered food and guarded the safety of the group. What did early man desire in a female mate? For men, perhaps it was a woman who would respect him as a leader, not challenge his authority, and be good at gathering food or cooking or making sleeping materials. Early man looked for patience, loyalty, and a resourceful nature in their female mates. In modern society, female desires for the strong and tall male are qualities that resonate, though these traits no longer apply. In our modern world of technology, males with superior intelligence are perceived as the new sexy whether the modern female is a business entrepreneur or waitress, this intelligent modern man implies economic viability and trustworthiness, important components to all long-term commitments. 
For early man and woman, relationship issues remain constant in the modern age because fidelity and respect are key factors to a successful alliance between two very different human creatures, man and woman. Once male-female bonds were recognized and established, sex between men and women at any given time in a committed relationship led to strong, long-lasting emotional commitments. This feature between men and women helped to ensure the safety and protection of the children of this marriage. Bonding protected the frail state of human children for long periods. Working together, mother and father protected their offspring to ensure survival to an age of self-sufficiency. Enabling the child then could contribute to the survival of the group. Because men with strong and broad shoulders were better suited to carry dead animals back to the cave that might be miles away, the care of the children and the home fell to lactating women and females in general. Older women were knowledgeable food gatherers. In addition, because of their experiences gained in life, they helped with medical needs. So it was the men with strong shoulders and backs who became skilled to hunt, kill, and carry heavy animal carcasses over perhaps long distances back to the family dwelling. This evidence exists in cave art showing such gendered activities within early human families. Neolithic humans lived in small bands. Typically, they lived in caves. Life was short and difficult. It was cold most of the year, and they frequently moved. As noted earlier, they produced stone and also wood tools used to fell animals or trees or for means of protection from rival bands. In this world, young females were highly prized because without them, the tribe could not continue to produce children. For this reason, among others, rival bands fought each other for young women and other important possessions. Early humans ate what they could find or kill. Like other animals, their sex slated for them in tribal bands to specific roles and activities. But likely these roles were not absolute. Talent, or lack thereof, either led early human men and women to rise to the occasion, such as felling an animal or fighting off threats, or the other alternative, of course, is to die. Around 10,000 years ago, the climate shifted as it became warmer. Glaciers receded and forests expanded. This was about 8,000 BC. Some scientists suggest that people became producers and planters, motivated by the desire of their favorite grains, nuts, and berries, along with their desire to have a ready stock of some animals. With settled living came the growth in population. While stone tools were still used, they were used also for planting efforts. Scholars have named this event the Neolithic Revolution. It gave rise to the development of agricultural, social, human groups to form and establish farms linked to villages. The major change in lifestyle was how Neolithic man acquired food. While Paleolithic man, these are the hunter-gatherer societies, continued to persist, Neolithic man tended to stay in one place and grow food resources rather than traveling long distances to find it. 
and bring it back home to the tribe. Neolithic man, because of his sedentary lifestyle and living life by the seasonal calendar, this left men and women time to create permanent structures, belief systems, and political ideologies as they had time on their hands. Because they stored food, they created pottery from earth and clay, dried in wood-fired kilns. In time, they mined ore from the earth and made jewelry, ceremonial objects, and traded in flint and tin. As people farmed and corralled animals, they developed new tools. In addition, once they discerned the difference between nitrogen-rich plants that enriched the earth and plants that depleted the goodness in the earth, crop rotation developed and was practiced. Once identified the positive fertilizer qualities using animal manure in pastures, this knowledge of replenishing the soil became valuable to communities. Archaeological digs have supported the idea for more than a century that the Neolithic Revolution began in the warmer climates of arid regions of the Eastern Mediterranean, otherwise known commonly as present-day Turkey. About 10,000 years ago, regional farmers practiced selective breeding, not only of animals, but also plants. Farming knowledge and social systems spread westward to what is present-day Europe. By 2600 BC, people in Central Europe began using ox-drawn plows to till heavier soils. Food and raw material surpluses resulted in trade between settlements. This attraction made settlements of interest to hunters and gatherers. However, because of their fixed locations, these settled peoples were subject to raids, soil degradation, and the shifts in the availability of water and or other necessities. Animals became domesticated, such as the pig. This led to new activities such as pastoralism, in which herds of animals were kept. New types of grains emerged with the domestication of wild grasses. This led to the development of starchy food products that sustained life year-round. These were wheat, barley, and legumes. In Greece and Europe, this transformation in food production and settled living evolved from about 6000 BC to about 2500 BC. From about 4000 to around 2600 BC, the domestication of animals took shape. Animals provided meat, milk, and were a source of labor and power. Wild sheep and goats could be herded and protected from wolves and wild cats. Thanks to the intelligence and ingenuity of Neolithic man, selective breeding enhanced animal qualities. This would include milk production or resulting in better woolly coats that would become clothing and or bedding. As trade between regions in flint, metals, or food resources became established and regular, this resulted in the spread of animals such as wild cattle coming from Africa, water buffalo developed in China, while the donkey appeared in settled societies in northern Africa. By 2500 BC, humans were ready to live in collective units. Why did humans settle down? Likely this resulted from several factors to which scholars are not in full agreement. Location, geography, and climate were features that likely led 
some people to choose established societies. Early man, like modern man, tends to be innovative and opportunistic as a species. And human concepts of efficient use of time could lead to success or failure of entire societies. Thus, a more effective use of human effort to produce a more reliable and in time better quality source of food developed. In addition, the access to raw materials valued for their use or life sustaining qualities were, um, and as arguably are, important to human settlements. About one million years ago, man came to understand how to set fires on purpose. Perhaps the knowledge to start fires or keep fires going was revered. In some Paleolithic societies, a good film that I recommend in regards to this point is Quest for Fire, which came out in 1981. In time, Paleolithic man developed skills to start fire when needed. The best source would be sparks made from knocking flint chips together. This stone source was preferred in making arrowheads, sharp tools, and for flint rocks. It was a shiny black rock, and the best source was using obsidian, which came from a volcanic source. Near Katohuyuk, in modern-day Turkey, this community developed around the mining of obsidian stone. The desire for trade, for food, for obsidian, might have outweighed the desire to move with the seasons and travel with their herds to new grazing areas. In addition, even with only small amounts of land, Paleolithic hunter-gatherers could provide themselves with much needed food by growing grains and domesticating animals such as in Katahuyuk. Then when producing a food surplus, Neolithic man traded food for other materials they needed that could be acquired from neighboring or distant settlements. By 2500 BC, humans were ready to live in small villages. An example of a scientifically studied Neolithic community is Katohuyuk. Early settlements practiced religion, debated the reason for their existence, pondered over the meaning of life, and revered the sun and earth while they created myths and stories about the stars. Neolithic farming settlements did not invent writing conventions and government systems associated with what we call civilized living. This would come later. From the very earliest times, human behavior has been characterized by migration, the creation of tools, and the formation of ever larger social groups. Difference across regions took shape in their belief systems, use of technology, and time management. Language, art forms such as textile, clothing, and pottery making, along with farming practices, differentiated peoples from one another. It is this ethnic makeup that makes us different from one another. What we do, believe, and how we do it. Thanks to the efforts by anthropologists and archaeologists, we are continuing to learn about societies of Paleolithic and Neolithic humans. In the modern age, using advances in technology, we will likely learn more as the years go by.